This episode of Selling with Social is brought to you by the 10th Annual AAISP Leadership Summit, where the sales community comes together to learn, share, and network. Join Vangresso and your sales peers April 3rd through the 5th, 2018 in Chicago by visiting bit.ly forward slash AAISP 2018 and use the code leadership 1095 at registration. And now to selling with social. Maybe the inside sales function is good for doing groundswell, gathering intel, getting details inside the CRM, doing the social research piece. But when it's time to carry the right conversation, it's the senior seller that needs to do it. You cannot outsource your own success. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez, Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. Mr. Tony Hughes. I am so excited you're joining me here on Selling with Social, my friend. It has been a long time. Hey, Mario. It's great to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. You're all the way from down under from Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, it's true. And I'm halfway between our two biggest capital cities at the moment. Half- <laughs> all right. All right. Fair enough. So right now it is one o'clock right now. It is eight o'clock your time. Yeah, it is. And it's tomorrow. So I know what's going to happen in the future. So you're from the future. I love it. Well, Tony Hughes, your reputation precedes you in a phenomenal way. Book author, keynote speaker. I also know you as a legendary, iconic individual within the world of social selling as well. But you've got a really good focus on sales prospecting. But more importantly, I'm holding in my hands for those of you that cannot see the book, the newest one, Combo Prospecting. And Tony, I got to tell you, I was a little upset over the title. Can I tell you why? Why? Because when I saw the book come out, I said, he stole my title. (laughs) (laughs) Congratulations. I'm very happy to spend some time talking about the powerful one-two punch that fills your sales pipeline and helps you win more deals. So Tony, do us a favor. I probably give an introduction. Did I miss anything about you? Give us a little background, your company. What do you do? Tell everybody what you do. The really short version is I've got 35 years in business and B2B sales. My last 12 years in the corporate world, I left the corporate world five years ago, but in my last 12 years, I was basically the CEO running the APAC region for North American tech companies. So I've got a real passion for B2B selling and I recognize there's really two key things that people need to do. They need to make sure that they know how to progress and win opportunities that they've got in play. And then the bigger issue is they need to create that sales funnel. So they need both oars in the water every day, every week, creating opportunities, progressing opportunities if they're going to be successful because new sales revenue and brand new customers is the lifeblood. It's the key healthy indicator for any business. Wait a minute. I thought marketing produces all of our leads. (laughs) I'm not sure what marketing do most of the time, right? I think we need to give the we need to get the head of marketing a sales quota and take all of the commoditized lower end stuff off salespeople and give it to marketing because they're good at figuring out how to go create experience and transact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now for our marketers here that are listening in, you know, I'm just playing with you and so is Tony. But in all fairness, actually, to your point, Tony, we just had a podcast with Sam Grambadre, the CMO of Terminus, an account-based marketing sales tool. And that was one of the exact topics that we talked about, which is marketing leaders need to also carry a quota as well, right? For helping us to be able to deliver on the sales pipeline. Nonetheless, there is some value there, certainly, but no doubt about it, I'm going to argue, and I don't know what the exact numbers are, maybe you have it, but at least 50% of our job is producing the sales pipeline as a salesperson. And I say the other 50% may come from marketing or inbound or those types of things. Yeah, well, let me tell you a crazy thing I hear all around the world when I work with individual salespeople, sales managers, people that run companies, is they universally say to me, hey, Tony, we know how to sell. 
The only problem we have is we just don't have enough sales pipeline. And I smile and say, well, if you knew how to sell, you would have enough sales pipeline. And it's an act of insanity to try and separate selling from creating sales pipeline. And I know there's been this massive trend to move toward the inside sales roles, those sales development reps or business development reps, where they're meant to create opportunities for the more expensive field people to go and prosecute. But the reality is it's only senior people that can carry the conversation at that C-suite level anyway. So maybe the inside sales function is good for doing groundswell, gathering intel, getting details inside the CRM, doing the social research piece. But when it's time to carry the right conversation, it's the senior seller that needs to do it. You cannot outsource your own success. Yeah, interesting, interesting thought. Now, I want to come back to that. But before I go too far down that particular path, I forgot to ask you, tell us something about yourself that nobody would know by looking at your social profiles because you're totally social. So do we know everything about you? (laughs) No, well, it's funny. I actually put my heart on my sleeve in my new book, Combo Prospecting, where I talked about the brutal way in which I first got into sales. But something most people won't know about me is that I survived a plane crash. Really? I did not know that. (laughs) How, when, and how did that happen? Uh, Look, I'll I'll give you the short version, but I was ready to go solo at a flying club in a Cessna in club record time, only six hours of instruction. And the flying instructor was very nervous because I was young. And he said to me, you know, Tony, what's the definition of confidence? I'm about to set you loose on your first solo circuit. What's confidence? And I said, well, I don't know. I guess confidence is when experience and skill comes together, you can be confident. And he just shook his head laconically and said, "Uh, no. He said, confidence is the feeling you have just before you understand the situation. And I've taken that definition with me through my business life, through my flying life. And he taught me to fly an airplane as if you're about to lose the engine. So for example, when you take off in a plane, taking off is much easier than landing, but it's the most dangerous phase. You've got to use all of the runway because if you lose your engine and most of the runway is behind you, it's of no value to you. So, you know, and he said to me, "Unless, unless you're on fire, you never have too much fuel on board, but you've got to be thinking, could there be water in the fuel? Could have insect have built a little nest inside one of my airspeed indicator tubes? Could the weather change? Just think about what could possibly go wrong and plan as much as you can. So I really botched a landing badly in an aerobatic biplane I owned and I replaced the timber propeller. What I didn't realize that I put a hairline fracture in the drive system. And every time I flew, it felt like it was all normal, but that little fatigue fracture was getting worse and worse and worse until it eventually failed. And I was above a pine forest, but I was flying illegally high so that if I lost my engine, I could glide out. And I managed to glide out. I rode off the airplane, but I walked away. But it was that definition of confidence. You know, it's, you know, you don't want to be ignorant. You don't want to be overconfident. You want to always be positively paranoid that saved my life. And I've taken that through my whole business career. Wow. That's an interesting story. I haven't had anybody that had a plane crash and survived. (laughs) 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 I guess that sounded a little awkward, didn't it? (laughs) 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 Because if they, (laughs) never mind, we're going to keep it at that one. That's That's an interesting story. I like that one. All right. So we've had a survivor of a plane crash and you were the one that was flying it. Yeah. And in the early pages of Combo, there's a picture of the crashed airplane. (laughs) All right. All right. Well, you'll have to make sure for those you're listening in, you'll have to make sure that you go out and grab a Combo prospecting. And actually it's found on page nine, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Page nine, I think. I like it. Uh, Fantastic. Well, let's get started. Let's talk about this Combo prospecting and the powerful one-two punch that is needed. Look, I'm of the opinion that selling today is harder. Now, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. Is it easier or is it harder today? What do you think? This is going to sound like a non-answer, but it's both, right? So at the first level, it has never been easier in the history of the world for salespeople to gain access to the information they need to go be successful. There's never been more ways to go and break through to somebody. So you could argue it's never been easier. What are you complaining about? But what you and I know is that the rates of failure, especially in B2B selling, have never been higher. So that's really the paradox is that it's never been easier, yet it's never been harder. And what we do know is it must be harder because the failure rates are growing. Yeah. Why do you think the failure rates are growing? There's a couple of things. The first thing is I think sellers have become way too snoozy and passive. 
they're depending on leads coming to them. They're abdicating responsibility. The next thing is, and it's an age old problem in sales, is they've got the wrong kind of narrative. I think people have lost the art of making it all about the other person. I know this is a really crazy thing to say, but I think great selling is like great sex. If it's all, <laughs> <laughs> if it's if it's all about the other person, not about you, it'll all be good, right? So sellers have got this sales breath where they repulse people because they're desperate to close the deal and they're all about them making their sale. And at the end of the day, many sellers have lost their way because they've forgotten that selling is really about helping somebody else achieve a far better state of affairs in their personal life and in their business. So you need almost, you need this passionate missionary zeal that I'm making a difference in people's lives. And it's about establishing, am I a good fit for them? Are they a good fit for me? And if they are, I'm going to be passionate about breaking through because I know I can help them. See, I wanted to come back to the sex comment, but, <laughs> but, but you, you just brilliantly kept on going. And now I've lost all of the ability to be able to come back to that particular point. <laughs> That was a good one. So if you make it all about the other person, you're going to have better sex. I got that one. All right. <laughs> but the point to take away from this, guys, for those you're listening, is I absolutely agree with you. And you and I probably both get prospecting messages that come into our box. And those prospecting messages are all about them trying to get something from us, right? Yes. And a great example of that is, I will tell you, this message that I'm about to talk about it intrigued me, and so I wanted to reply, but an individual actually sent me a note saying, hey, I saw this article that you wrote, which was over a year ago. I would love it if you would reference our company inside of this particular article. Would you be willing to do that? Now, what I knew is, is they were looking for a backlink from a strong website, vingresso.com, right, which gives them a strong juice from a backlink perspective. My response back to them was, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this, right? Yeah. You want me to backlink to you to give this to my users, but so what? For what? What purpose, right? And I happen to be a CEO of this company that is an up and coming company. But I just thought about that and I got the response back and he actually prepared a response that was, that was a good response about what's in it for me and what they might be able to help us do and do for us. But my whole point in responding that way was you missed it the first time around. And as a result of missing it the first time around, I very likely would have just hit delete. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. I agree with you. And so the key here is how do you make it all about the other person, right? And to your point about selling and it being easier, 100% agree. More data, more information makes it sometimes more complicated because you're trying to figure out like what the heck do I do I use, right? But then harder because it's harder to reach out to these individuals because so many folks are sending the messages all about me, <laughs> all about them and yeah. not about the individual and about their individual business problem. So you also tell me a little bit about the book and what inspired you to write Combo Prospecting because the nuggets inside of here are fantastic. And you talk about combo prospecting, we talk about, or I talk about the omni-channel approach, right? And yes. how there's no one size fits all. It's everything that you've got to do in order to be able to prospect. And, and when I say everything, we're talking about the phone, social, video, texting, right? And the list goes on. So what inspires you to write combo prospecting? Well, before I answer that, I've got to tell you, I love everything that you talk about with Omnichannel. And I believe that B2B sellers need to learn from B2C. B2C has been facing this apocalyptic commoditization of what they sell with the way that trade barriers are being dismantled, the way that companies can be disrupted so easily. New competition can come in really easily now. So B2B sellers need to take the same lessons. Um, but with Combo Prospecting, it's actually the collective wisdom of well over 100,000 people that have been engaging with me over a four-year period as I blog. So the book is really a collection of all of the things that I've been blogging about when it comes to being successful in sales and creating pipeline. And everything's been A-B tested. So people would write in and say, hey, this really works, or I really don't agree with this, and this is why. So then I'd go do more research and more investigation. And what I found is when you jump online and try and look for stats and research, there's a lot of misinformation out there, right? So my audience really tested a lot of the stats that I thought I'd found, and, and they helped really validate the concepts. So it's the collective wisdom of the best sellers on the face of the planet in both Europe, North America, and Asia Pacific. And it's just all designed to solve that one massive problem that people have, which is how do they crack the code of creating pipe? So how do you crack the code? Give us a nugget. Okay. So there's a lot of combinations that the truth about anything in life that we want to be successful at is there's no silver bullet. So the first thing is you need to have the right narrative and it needs to be all about the other person and making a difference. 
And you need to combine that with the right multi-channel approach to find a way to break through. So that's the basic one too. I need the right narrative and then I need the right combinations of channels to be able to break through to them. If we have a look at selling today about, you know, why it's become more difficult, I really believe that there's um, three big trends that everyone needs to be aware of. And increasingly today, buyers expect us to truly know them and they expect us to know them before we even have their initial conversation with them, which is why social is important and so powerful. The next thing is they expect us to personalize the experience for them. Generic messages just don't work today. We've got to personalize the experience. And the third thing, which is kind of crazy, they expect us to really anticipate their needs. They expect us to be a mind reader. So they expect us to truly know them, to personalize the experience and anticipate what it is that they need. And the insane thing is they expect us to do that before they have a conversation with us to educate us. So one of the big mistakes I see sellers making today is they adopt this friending strategy, especially in social, as a way of trying to start a relationship with somebody. And the irony is that we as salespeople, as business people, as entrepreneurs, we cannot be successful. It is impossible for us to be successful unless we can build positive relationships of trust with people. Yet the irony is, the paradox is that nobody worth getting to for us is lonely and bored and looking for a new friend, not one. So what they want is value from us in the conversation. And that's what you just said, right? When that person ran that piece of outreach for you, you're thinking, well, what am I going to get out of doing this? Why would I bother reading on, let alone take the time to do this? So we need to lead with value. And by leading with value, we can then start to build a relationship. And the two most powerful things for every salesperson listening to this, if you take nothing else away, the two most powerful things in sales are referrals and trigger events. And the reason trigger events are important is they start a conversation with context. And the reason referrals are important is because they start the conversation or the relationship with trust. And all business is done at the speed of trust. No sale will ever be made without trust. The size of the deal will relate to how much trust is present. And social plays a huge role in us being able to find paths to monitor for trigger events and to find ways of being introduced to somebody to begin the conversation well. Yeah. I was on a podcast, my podcast, with Paul Tashima, the CEO of Nudge, nudge nudge.io. Wow. And he gave me a stat that I had never heard before. And so I had to go out there and you know look this information up and validate because it, it was mind boggling that OpenView did a recent study and determined that 84% of all deals in the pipeline resulted as a result of a referral. Wow. Now that was just mind boggling to me. And what this showed was is the power to your point, right? Two areas if they took nothing away, referrals and trigger events. Hallelujah. Cannot disagree, right? <laughs> Hallelujah, right? <laughs> That's what I say. But referrals like, are the cornerstone to selling. And if you think about it in the good old days with selling, you would just simply call up, you know, John Smith, fellow CIO, and, or, you know, Susie Q, you know, fellow whoever it might be, and say, hey, I'm looking at deploying a, who did you guys use? Or what did you guys use? And then John or Susie will give you a referral and usually it's the referral of the salesperson, right? And so we've gone away from leveraging that in a significant way. And it is as a result of we're in this idea that if we can socially connect with somebody, now all of a sudden we're in the friend network, right? And I agree with you that that by far is not the friend network. Now, what it does is it keeps us top of mind. Right. Yeah. And it can help keep us top of mind so that when someone is looking for a referral, like you, I get all the time, daily, weekly, somebody tagging me and saying, Hey, Mario, you may so and so is asking for something, and I'm not even on that string of, of you know, in terms of communications. So it's helping me keep top of mind to get those types of referrals and trigger events. Well, I mean, we can talk a lot about that, but, you know, but it's going to lead me right back to this concept of referrals and trigger events are two things that are taught inside of social selling. Yeah. And you know, there's this element here of social versus the phone. And we both agree that it's a combo. You call it combo prospecting. I call it the omni-channel approach. They mean the exact same thing, right? Yes. Yeah. But is social really all that it's cracked up to be social selling? And before you answer that question, we're going to listen to this message from our program sponsor. I'm super excited to share that Vingresso will be joining the AAISP and hundreds of sales leaders in Chicago for the 10th annual AAISP Leadership Summit, April 3rd through the 5th, 2018. 
In fact, I personally will be presenting and I want to invite you to join me. The Leadership Summit brings together sales leaders from around the globe for a learning experience unlike any other. Attendees will find workshops, group learning, a technology expo packed full of today's leading solution and service providers, and of course, the infamous annual Inside Sales Award Gala. To receive your deeply discounted rate, visit bit.ly forward slash AAISP2018. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash AAISP2018. And use the code LEADERSHIP1095 at registration for an amazing Vengresso only discount. Okay, before we took that break, I asked you the question, is social selling all that it's cracked up to be? And mind you, you're an individual that has grown your brand through social. You have taught social selling in some of various different environments from a training perspective. So I want to know your answer. Is it all that is cracked up to be given the fact that you wrote, just wrote a book on called Combo Prospecting? It is, but people use it as an excuse for doing the things that they need to do to be successful. So we all know that the moment you open up a laptop computer and you start looking at email, LinkedIn, Facebook, social platforms, you start researching, you go, holy hell, half the day's gone and I haven't actually done any real selling. So salespeople confuse social marketing with social selling. So I think social selling is really important, but don't confuse social marketing with social selling. They are two completely different things. If you're not driving engaged conversations with people that result in creating qualified opportunities or progressing an existing sales opportunity, you're not really selling. So yes, you need to build your brand. Yes, you need to research. Yes, you need to monitor, for example, do social listening for things like trigger events. Yes, you can collaborate in social. You know, All of those things are really important. But at the end of the day, you've got to drive engaged interactions and conversations with people. That's really what selling is. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head. We talk about at Bingresso, the five steps to digital selling. And step number five is creating more conversations. Leaders ask me all the time, Mario, you know, what's the ROI? Prove out the ROI. And it's like, first off, we're not going to even talk about whether or not there's an ROI. You're not even reaching 90% of your audience through the phone, right? So you've got to create a multi-channel approach. I'm not saying that this is the silver bullet, just like you said, Tony, it's not the silver bullet, but it is a bullet. And it's one of the bullets that you must use to be able to engage with your buyers. But how do you measure it? How do you measure success? The same exact way that you measure your phone prospecting. How many freaking conversations did you have? How many appointments did you book, right? Yes, and how many qualified deals did you put in your pipeline? Yeah, now I actually, I stopped short of the qualified deals because one of the areas, as you know, that we don't touch is I can't control a sales rep and what they say when they pick up the phone to say hello beyond the hello, right? That's another sales organization's training curriculum, right? Mm-hmm. What do you say? Value messaging, those types of things. And those are some of the things that you teach your sales folks that you train, but it's really all about driving conversations. And so I love your point that if you're leveraging social, you have to ask yourself, how many conversations is it driving? Yeah. Agree? Yeah. I absolutely do. It's all about, are you creating engagement with people who can buy from you? And it might be, tell me if I'm wrong here, and I think this is the theme of your book, it might be that you're socially engaging with somebody, it might not lead to a conversation immediately, but then you turn around and you pick up the phone, and now they're like, oh, Tony Hughes, didn't that guy just follow me on LinkedIn, or didn't he just wish me a happy anniversary, or didn't he just you know, send me an article on something? And then maybe you follow it up with a video message as an example, right? And you give that one, two, three punch that you're talking about in the combo prospecting. And it might be that all three combined is what's leading to a conversation. Would you agree with that? I do. And that's, and that is the big, big finding that caused me to drive the creation of the book is that we all know that email on its own will never yield the results that you need. Social on its own won't yield the results. Phone on its own won't yield the results. But if you combine them into a really quick triple, if you call, voicemail, email, and then if you want to back that up with even a Twitter direct message or an email, if you drive rapid combinations, the person thinks, holy hell, this person deserves a response. And if you really think about it, the person's on their way to the office and their cell phone rings and they have a look at it and they go, well, I don't know who this is. I won't take it. 
Next thing, their cell phone beeps. They've left a voicemail. Next thing, it beeps at them again and there's a text message. And it beeps again because there's an email that's gone into their inbox and they have a look at that and they think, wow, if you've got the right narrative, they'll think, gee, this person's determined. They deserve a response. And what it does is it dramatically ups the responses to email. And what I say to people is when you get a reply to that email, don't reply to the email yourself again. Call them. Everything has got to go back to the phone. If you send someone a text message and they send a text message back, call them. If you send an email, they come come back, call them. If you send an email and they reply, go ahead and call them. You want the power of your voice is incredible. You're wanting to create engagement. But salespeople have said to me, look, there's no point really using the phone because people don't answer it. And the first thing is that is a complete lie. It's not true. People go, well, you know, no one wants to be cold called. Okay, I agree with that, but just warm it up. It's so easy with social, as you just described, to warm up a call. If you've got a cadence, if you're spending a couple of hours every day with that ore in the water that, you know, that you're pulling on of creating pipeline, regardless of how much you're doing with the other hand, progressing opportunities, because that's why people have these horrible spikes in performance, these big peaks and troughs. Yeah. is because they're busy closing deals you know, for one month or something and doing no prospecting. Then they crash and burn in a month or a quarter and they thrash around creating pipeline. Then they feel good about enough pipeline and they stop prospecting and they just have this horrible roller coaster ride. But the reality is in social, it's so easy to warm things up and you just need a cadence of every day, a few hours. I've got this balanced mix of on the phone, in social, sending emails. I've got a blended omni-channel approach as you actually describe it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love what you just described. And on the inbound side, one of the things that we've seen that's worked really, really well, especially if someone has downloaded an asset and they provide it their name, phone number, and email. One of the things that we've done is we will immediately, if you've given a phone number, we'll immediately call you. But as soon as you place a phone call, it's an unknown caller ID. And in most cases, what do you think most people do, Tony? I don't know this person. I'll let it go through to voicemail. (laughs) Exactly right. So you leave a voice message. And in that voice message, we say, you obviously just downloaded this, blah, 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 blah. We want to reach out to you, have a conversation, blah, 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 blah. Right? So whatever your, your messaging is. But then at the very end, what you say is, I just want to let you know that I'll be following up with the text because likely you don't recognize this particular voice message. And also, I'll send you an email as well in case there's a better time that we can coordinate. So then immediately, you've turned around with a email let them know that you probably didn't recognize my voice message. So I wanted to let you know, you know, put it on email. And oh, by the way, I'm going to send a text. Now we do that. Just take a wild guess, Tony, which medium, email, text, or phone gets the fastest response to? Phone. Phone. Actually, text. Ah, okay. Text will get the fastest response because in the text you say, hey, Tony, I just left a voice message you probably didn't pick up because you didn't recognize my number, but I'm just actually following up from your inquiry. And immediately someone says, Oh yeah. Okay. I didn't recognize it. Yes. I'd love to have a conversation with you or not. Right. And they'll message back to you. And so, cause as you and I both know, I get over 250 messages a day. So it just gets buried in my email box, but that's that combo prospecting that you're talking about. I think, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. It's using the blended approach of all of the things and the person will respond in one of the channels and you're right. They'll typically respond to email or text message because it's easy. If they're on public transport, going to work, or whatever in the morning, they're never going to take a call anyway in a crowded environment. And often people sit in meetings trying to clear, everyone's trying to get the inbox zero, right? Exactly <laughs> so right. Think, how, do, how do I just get back to this person and clear it out the way? Yeah. Yeah. I want to move on into a topic that you talk about here in combo prospecting and It is on why being beat up is good for the soul. Hmm. (laughs) Every day, we as salespeople and sales leaders, we're in the trenches, right? We're hopefully carrying the walk on the front lines, whether you're a vice president or above, hopefully you're getting beat up in the trenches with your sales teams. But what I want to talk about is, is what does that mean? Why being beat up is good for the soul? Talk a little bit about what you mean by this particular section of your book. To give you the background, and again, in in combo prospecting in the beginning of the book, I talk about my background, but at 25, I'd gone to the USA and set up my own company. So I was was an entrepreneur and the truth is I failed and I came back to Australia and we were getting royalties for 12 years from selling the company that we had here before I went to the States to take the concept over there. And because we're getting royalties, I couldn't compete in that industry. And the big lesson I learned in the US at age 25 was that I had this very negative attitude about selling. I didn't believe in the value of the sales function. I did. I thought it was about great product market fit and great marketing. I was wrong. 
But when I came back, I thought, you know what? I need to personally learn how to sell. If I want to be an entrepreneur and a successful business person and a leader in life, I need to learn how to sell. And boy, did I get beat up. (laughs) And it is good for us. You know, all of us have got hangups. The most recent generations are coming through a kind of wide for this easy button that they want to push. You know, they just go very shallow on everything typically and not deep. They don't want to do the brutally hard things for sustained periods of time to earn the right to really elevate in an organization. But the truth is, if selling was easy, it wouldn't be as rewarding. The fact that it's so rewarding and we can earn the same money as doctors, dentists, lawyers, airline pilots, you know, all of these professions is because it is difficult. And the biggest point of it being difficult is the battles that we face within our soul. So we've got to face our own demons. So anyone who wants to go be a leader in life or be successful in business should work in a call center and learn how to sound better and be more confident. And you have your hangups bashed out of you, <laughs> which is a really good thing. You know, once you're free of the negative opinions of other people. I forget whose quote that is, but once you're free of the negative opinions of other people, you're truly free as a person. You think, well, I don't really yeah. care anymore. I'm, I'm about helping other people. I'm comfortable with who I am and what I do. And that's when you can truly go and be successful. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's kind of like the school of hard knocks, right? You got to go through the school of hard knocks to be able to earn your stripes and to uh, showcase your skill. And I have a rule, it's called the rule of 10. And I think this goes well in line with your combo prospecting, particularly for the new folks that are coming into the world of selling. And I love what you said, and I'm talking about the rule of 10 in a second, but I love what you said because, Tony, if you haven't gone through getting the hangups or getting a door slammed on you and said, get the heck out of this business park or whatever, right? like you really haven't sold, right? You're just, you just haven't sold. And that's tough. But I have a rule and it's called the rule of 10. And essentially it's, For 10 days out of 21 business days in a month, you're going to send every day, each of those 10 days, 10 emails, 10 texts, 10 videos, 10 phone calls, 10 LinkedIn messages, and 10 social engagements, right? And this is that combination prospecting that allows you to be able to touch somebody in a different way. And then you're recording, by the way, if I reach out to Tony and he responds via, say, a video message, but not through, say, email or not through a phone call, well, guess what? I'm going to record that in my CRM so that I know that there's a higher propensity that Tony may respond back to a video message than any other form, right? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about in terms of like this combo prospecting and then, you know, getting beat up is good for your soul. Getting an email that says you're a freaking moron, you stupid idiot. Don't ever email me again, right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, well, Resistance is what makes us stronger. And there's no such thing as becoming good at something and becoming successful unless you embrace failure. Like it's, we all, you know, all know the Michael Jordan stats and all of those things, right? But, you know, if you want to go out with a beautiful other person, you've got to be willing to get rejected. You've got to be willing to walk up to the person and try. And sure, they may reject you and lots of other people may reject you. But if you keep doing it, you will manage to get a date, you know, with that other amazing person. If you you sit back overthinking the whole thing and think, I don't want to get rejected, you know, it's all got to be perfect before I try. Um, I want to take all of the risk out of all of this. You'll never be successful in life. You've just, you've got to be willing to risk yourself and your own ego and failure and get beat up. And in getting beat up, you will get better. It's the best way to get better. And I often see salespeople trying to polish their A plus message, you know, before they're going to send it out. And I just say, look, if you send 30 B plus outreaches a day out to people, you will get massively more results than sending two or three A plus messages. You will generate A plus messaging very quickly if you've got that level of volume because you will figure it out. Well, not only will you generate that A-plus messaging, but if you're doing as you suggested before, which is leveraging the material to be able to do research or trigger events, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then you're going to be able to figure out how to turn most of those conversations or those engagements, those one-way, turn them into a two-way engagement by leveraging some of the things that you talked about earlier. Yeah, Particularly exactly. bring value. Yeah, yeah. And here's the reality, and I'll just make up a scenario. If you're trying to sell... So the chief financial officer, the CFO of an organization, and you're monitoring for trigger events. In other words, we provide solutions into this particular industry. It impacts the financial performance of those companies really well. I can prove it. So trigger event is when a new CFO starts in any of the companies that are in my hitting zone. 
I'm going to do some outreach to them. And, you know, and I'm going to have a narrative that typically says, hey, John, congratulations on the new role. The reason I'm calling is I work with CFOs that are new into a company. And what I commonly see is that they're looking for some early wins that really make a difference to the bottom line results on their P&L. Would love to share with you what I've seen other CFOs do that are new into roles that I think could make a difference. And you, you haven't pitched your product or your services or your solution. What you're doing is you're just using a trigger event and you've got empathy for the big thing that's worrying them. They're thinking, how do I go deliver some results quickly to justify this big salary that I've got? They're probably suffering from imposter syndrome themselves thinking, you know, wow, this is a step up. Am I going to get found out? You know, will I be successful? So you can become the trusted advisor that can help them go and make a difference in their new role. And they'll take you into every new company they ever go and work in if you do this right. So if you create a narrative that's all about them and providing some insights for them, and it's not about you and your product, you use triggers for context. And if you can warm it up additionally with someone in common that knows them, if you've got the referral and the trigger event going, it's like, it's absolutely a home run. Yeah, I agree with you. I love that particular piece of advice. So that may be your top piece of advice here, but but let's net it out. What does it take to be successful or to succeed in today's sales environment? Massive levels of action beyond what people are doing today. And it's got to be the omni-channel combos of what you're doing. It's like the first thing is, am I clear about the difference I make in the lives of my customers professionally and in their business? Am I really clear about that? What business outcomes do I deliver for people, right? And the language of leaders is delivering outcomes and managing risk. And then they immediately go one level below that. And they want to know about the impacts in terms of dollars, percentages, and the KPI metrics by which they measure their business and within their role. So that's what the language of leaders is. So the first thing is you need to nail your narrative and you need to be all about them and you need to earn the right. Because one of the challenges in selling is that we all get delegated down to who it sounds like we deserve to be talking to. So the moment you talk about product, they'll go push you to someone that has a look at new products, for example. So we've got to elevate our conversations. Then the next piece is massive levels of combinations of activity. And my view is 30 to 50 a day. I know you say 10. I was actually talking yesterday on the phone with a client and they said to me that they sat down with their sales team a year ago, and they said to them, look, I'm not going to tell you what I expect you to do. I want you to come up with the numbers as a sales team. What do you think is reasonable every workday in terms of the numbers of calls? Now, you're going to combine with the call, sending an email and other things, but, but let's just say the number of calls to prospects, so people aren't customers yet, logged in our Salesforce CRM, what do you think is reasonable? And the team agreed a number of three. They agreed that three calls a day was reasonable. A year later, not one person in the company's done that. Like mm. not one. And what I said to this guy is, it's not three a day, it's 30 a day. <laughs> like where are people, you know, where is their head when they're thinking that I don't need to spend an hour or two a day driving pipeline creation activity and I can still be successful. I don't know what people are doing thinking that. Yeah. Good point. And to clarify, my rule of 10 is you're doing 60 activities, right? So it's wow. 10 emails, 10 texts, 10 yeah. phone calls, 10 LinkedIn messages, and yeah. you're doing that 10 times throughout the month. So it's basically 60 activities per one of those 10 days, which nets out to be about 600 activities across the entire month, right? So and anybody who does that is successful, right? You know yeah. that. You see yeah, that with absolutely. your clients. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is really for the new folks, right? Who are, I hate making phone calls, right? Okay, change it up. You do 10 calls and then you're gonna do 10 more emails. And then you're going to do 10 more LinkedIn messages and 10 more videos. Fine. Change it up, right? I mean, you have six different ways that you can engage with somebody. And by the way, oh, 10 is too many. I can't get 60 done in a day. Okay, do five, <laughs> right? Five, five, five times six different activities is still 30, to your point, 30 prospecting activities per day out of 21 business days a month. Yeah, Mario, but here's the thing. The way I teach people to do it is call, leave a voicemail, send an email. It's 90 seconds. It's done. Go to the next one. Yeah, right? great so point. It's, like just, just do them in a little cluster. Call, voicemail, email. Call, voicemail, email. And then you can supplement that with all of the other things, but that's the basic combination that'll get someone. And you're right. They'll typically text you back if you send a text or they'll reply to the email back, right? So they yeah. tend to do a short email anyway. So that's really the key. Well, there you have it. 
the words of wisdom coming from the great, the very well-known Tony Hughes. And Tony, congratulations on the book here. I've begun reading this book. And I, as you can tell, I'm excited about it because, well, you took my title and you took the <laughs> <laughs> But nonetheless, Tony, before we go, if someone wants to be able to connect with you or reach out to you, what's the best way? Is it LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? Yeah, so it's all of those things. So, you know, use Combo on me. So you can obviously contact me inside LinkedIn. I've got about a quarter of a million followers of my blog in LinkedIn. It's continuing to grow rapidly. And I've also got two websites. So me as a public speaker doing keynotes for kickoffs is tonyhughes.com.au. And my methodology website is rsvpselling.com. And my Twitter handle is Tony Hughes AU. Fantastic. And one final question for you, my friend. I always love asking all of my guests this. <laughs> Their all-time favorite movie ever. What is it? Uh, it's got to be Shawshank Redemption. But in business, it's Jerry Maguire. I just, I love, love Jerry Maguire. A man who found his soul in selling and got fired for it and then came back. You know, it was great. There you go, Jerry Maguire and Shosh. Both of them have been used before, Shawshank Redemption and Jerry Maguire. All right, there we go. You've heard Tony's favorite movies right there. And Tony, I want to thank you for joining me here today on Selling with Social. It's been great to have you, my friend. Thanks, Mario. I love all you do. Everybody should follow you. Thank you, buddy. Thanks. And stay tuned for this particular message right now. Don't forget to join Vingresso and hundreds of sales leaders from around the globe April 3rd through the 5th, 2018 in Chicago for the 10th annual AAISP Leadership Summit. To receive your deeply discounted rate, visit bit.ly forward slash AAISP 2018. That's bit.ly forward slash AAISP 2018. And use the code LEADERSHIP1095 at registration for an amazing Vengresso only discount. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. So.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes, along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. 